uh, I don't know if you all know where you're sitting. Maybe you do, because there's a sign on the, on the wall here. But um, you know, I'm just going to give you a like, really quick presentation about what this organization does, and then hand it over. Um, and then we'll have a panel after that. Okay, so um, follow We're actually going to hop in really quick and explain all break in between. But oh, I said break. break. And then, oh, I said break. OK. Um, so also bear with me. This presentation has some interesting quirks. Okay. Here we go. Um, so Upwardly Global is a national organization that works with immigrant professionals who have relocated to the United States and are trying to get back into their professional field. So it could be you know, someone who's worked in the gallery scene, or it could be a doctor, or it could be an accountant. Um, we work with people of all professional backgrounds, all cultural backgrounds, um, and as long as they're ready to work um, in the United States, we will work with them. <laughs> um, so this is our mission, you know, we're, we're really here to help people integrate and restart their lives in the United States, to have economic empowerment, to improve their lives for their families and for themselves. I love this thing. Uh, this is our vision. Uh, we are, I think I kind of just said that, so I'm going to skip over that part again. Um, so nationally, we have about 50 staff members, and we're a very diverse staff. We have people from 20 different countries working on our staff, um, and those offices are located here in New York. We have an office in D.C. We have an office in Chicago and one in San Francisco, but we do work with people from all across the country. Um, and these are the criteria for our training program, which is a free program. Um, as long as someone has a work authorization, they have a bachelor's degree or higher from a foreign university, uh, two years of work experience or thereabouts um, in their home country, but they haven't been able to secure a job in the US, uh, and then having been here five years or less uh, in the United States without having found uh, professional work yet, we're really here to help them get their first step back. Um, and of course, they do have to have an intermediate plus level of English so that they can understand the training that we're offering and also kind of find themselves able to work in a U.S. work environment. Um, so what we're talking about here is a training program where we're offering uh, five core courses to job seekers. And they're basically, you know, these courses are applied to anyone, um, and once they've completed these courses, then they move on to more customized support. Um, but the first course is resume development. Um, we talk about marketing yourself, um, how to interview for a job in the United States. Um, you know, all these things are very different in different countries. It's really not a transferable thing necessarily. Um, you know, a lot of people's resumes have a picture on it where they're from here in the United States. You wouldn't get very far with that. Um, and yeah, and once that's done, then they get to work with an advisor in their field um, and also get access to a volunteer network and a network of employers. And we also have 4,000 alumni across the country, and they are our biggest allies and assets, um, helping us to get jobs for other people. I think I can kind of skip over this, but this is generally the program that we run. Usually it takes people a couple of weeks. Oh. Shoot, you know, I just realized I don't have audio for this video. <laughs> so I'm going to skip that too. Uh, but I could point you guys to our website later and you can check it out if you want. Um, so I mentioned that it's a free program. Um, and as anybody knows, it, there's no guarantee of finding a job, no matter who you are or where you're from. Uh, but you know, a lot of people come hoping that we can give them a promise, like, you know, it'll take you a couple of months or a couple of weeks. It really is impossible to guess, but um, we do our best to kind of keep people motivated. That's one of the biggest challenges, you know, after you've been here a while, you're running out of money, you thought you'd find a job and you couldn't, um, you know, it's easy to want to give up. And we're really here to try to keep people from doing that. Um, credential evaluation is pretty important for some industries, not for others. 
you know, a doctor is going to need to know to have their degrees evaluated. Um, a gallerist does not need to do that. Um, and if anybody knows somebody, someone who might want to apply for our program, um, you can just check out our website and they can go on there and uh, fill it out. You can also take my business card and pass it around. If anyone has questions, they can always reach out to me. So that is my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I actually do. Um, so how long is the application process? Uh, so you know, the application itself is not too, it's pretty short. Mm -hmm. Once somebody applies to our program, it takes about five days before they will hear from a staff member. We'll just verify the information that they gave us. Uh, once they're accepted, then they would go through an orientation where they kind of learn more about the program um, and get started on their resume. And at that point, then they would be able to get access to the full training. So that takes, depends, but um, for most people, less than two weeks. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, how's the, um, the funding of the program? Where is that from? Um, so we have most of our funding coming from foundations. Robin Hood Foundation is one of our, our biggest funders here in New York. Um, and we really do have a lot of regional funders, so we don't have a lot of national funding. Although we did get a bunch of money from Accenture for some technical projects recently. Um, and we work with you know, community-based funding as well as some individual donors. So, yeah. Any other questions? Any questions from you? <laughs> this is my husband. He has to listen to me talk about it all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys for, for listening. And um, again, if you know anyone you think might be interested, pass them on. Because um, we, we want to keep doing what we're doing. It feels more important every day, um, as you guys all probably could understand. Um, we just need to make, make life easier for some people who may not have the access and the resources on their own. So. Thank you. Thank I'm going to hand it over. Yeah, we're just going to get, well, we don't have a presentation. We're just going to give kind of like an overview. Um, do you want to join? Yeah. I guess we can start by introducing ourselves. Hi, I'm Audrey Lambert, and I'm one of the, uh, the three uh, the co founders of Albury Card Fair. So moving through the introduction, All Break Art Fair is, is a nonprofit art fair which provides free and accessible contemporary art programming and exhibitions um, through partnerships uh, with our local and community-based uh, nonprofit partners. Um, it's an annual event and happens every year along with the Armory Art Week here in uh, New York City. So we're founded in 2016, and Outbreak strives to present art exhibitions and events that include a wide range of voices to expand the conversation around human rights. Our 2016 theme was Shift, and examined how shifting our focus to community building could benefit both arts and social justice initiatives. And our 2017 theme for this year is United. We're going to focus this year on improving solidarity across our arts and social justice organizations. And my name is Adam Zucker. Um, and uh, moving forward with the alt break, our goal is to focus on how we can grow and expand links between the art world and the community at large, um, which, which is community building is going to be a key part of our organization. And we want to touch base with anyone here about ways to partner and extend our vision. So uh, we are accessible. You can find us online. You can shoot us an email, a tweet. Um, our website is altbreakartfair.org, and um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah. And this is our co-founder as well. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm Kimi Katata. Um, so thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much to Upperly Global for hosting us, and Sarah. And thank you so much to our three panelists for speaking tonight. Thank you. So welcome to our three panelists. Really wonderful to have this group of people, and especially um, have the three of you here. Um, I think we should start, of course, by doing some introductions. Maybe we can start here and go down this way, and then I'll ask a few questions, and then at the end we'll have time for Q and A. Okay. So how about you? Um, start. My name is Hiba Shabazz, and I'm an artist. Do you want more? Um, you could tell us 
where you're from, how long you've been in New York. I'm from Pakistan and I've been here in New York for six years or so. Okay. Um, I live in Brooklyn. I paint all day. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Lionel Cruet. Um, um, I'm an artist, I'm an art educator as well, and I live here in New York City now. I've spent most of the time in my practice between New York and Puerto Rico, um, where I'm originally from, and uh, yeah, I've been doing that for the last like five years. Hi, uh, I'm Dhanishri Gadia, and uh, I'm an installation artist uh, from India. Moved to um, the U.S. about five years ago. Uh, I work in the city and live in Connecticut as of now, but planning to move to the city next month, so I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till it gets warmer. Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, so I'll just start with you, and then if everyone could um, consider and then answer this question, uh, can go that way. Um, how has moving here affected your practice? Um, Well, there's definitely been a huge change in the way I work um, ever since I moved here. Uh, firstly, because I paint female nudes and I lived in Pakistan, so I had a lot of trouble showing my work there. And um, New York has been really kind of great in the way that it literally has so many opportunities that it's kind of enabled me to work as an artist much more freely than I could have if I had not moved here. <laughs> um, do you feel like New York poses new challenges to you? Yeah, definitely. Like I moved here when I was 30 and I was pretty much, you know, kind of very settled. Um, I was also a full-time university teacher and I had a place, I had a house of my own, and um, I came here and pretty much had no idea what I was doing. So that was a challenge. That sounds um, like a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, okay. And Leon, how about you? Um, how has moving here affected your practice? I think, let me think about this. I think there's like a lot of like ideas that I'm thinking in. You know references, but one of the main reasons that I moved to New York was because um, uh, Cooney uh, City College invited me to continue graduate studies in here. Uh, they were kind of like developing a program at that point um, about interdisciplinary and digital art practices, and I think I had a lot of like questions. I was very interested. I you know was working with a lot of kind of like interdisciplinary work and doing um, you know uh, work that like bridges, you know, working with different mediums, working with communities, you know, developing my own work, to, um, you know, during that, and I think it was kind of like the right timing, so I moved here kind of like as a, that uh, invitation to continue uh, studies in here, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and what kind of different challenges do you find yourself facing in New York that you didn't face in Puerto Rico? I think challenges, one of them was actually language, was one of the first and foremost, like, and I, I develop and I'm still developing, I'm still learning, so um, one of the things that like helped me was actually uh, teaching, like being in a classroom and working with, uh, um, you know, multicultural uh, schools, uh, public schools, because there's, you know, other students who have challenges, you know, like kind of like assimilating and learning and, you know, learning languages, so it was kind of like, you know, learning my own way as well, so that that was kind of like mutually beneficial, um, and also working in scenarios where I have to like deal with uh, with the public and with people. So that you know those two uh, you know uh, references or points like helped me, but definitely like language was one of the things. Like I happened to like even be like in grad school doing presentations with like you know somehow like grammatical errors, orders of like sentences, and you know th and you know I. I apologize, and I still do to the, you know, my professors and everything. But you know, I think that is, you know, 
that is part of like experiencing and learning and nurturing yourself. Yeah. And from what I understand, you know, even when it is no longer an actual barrier, it can still be a psychological barrier. Um, right, right. Because then double when, checking yourself. And right, and when you are doing perhaps like things that are you know closer to you know or or, or well, then you still with that in the back of your head, you're like, yeah, I'm not doing this right, and <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I think you know with time, like things develop, and I, I hope to like get more perfect in that in that sense. But um, other challenges, I feel like. Financial are two definitely, and you know that those are things that that you know you have to deal with, um, and that was something that I kind of like put in my in my head and in my mind. I was like, I'm moving here. I know that people in New York like, you know, unless you're like have, you know, some sort of like financial stability or have been living in the city, like you have to take a lot of different appointments and jobs and do many things. So I thought about that, and I was like assimilating all of that at the same time. So, yeah. Uh, like Lyra was just mentioning, there's a lot of layers to that question, I think. Uh, I think one of the most uh, important things that happened uh, in my own art practice was I got out of Michelle uh, when I moved to New York. Like, I was put in a, not uncomfortable, but in a very foreign place, where I was m uh, meeting people from different cultures, which I never did when I was in India. So that was like one of the main uh, uh, things that shifted in my art practice. The second thing was I think I found a voice in my own art practice, which I did not. Back in India, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. And um, moving here, like, you know, I, was, I worked in a very autobiographical uh, way in India. And, like, you know, moving here, uh, going through this immigration experience, uh, my work moved more, more towards uh, community-based projects. So, like, you know, I worked a lot with the immigrant community, like, interviewed them, uh, like, you know, incorporated that with my art practice. I think that was a very big shift when I moved to New York. So, yeah. Next question. Um, how has working under the new U.S. administration reframed your artistic practice, if at all? Um... I spend a lot more time protesting. <laughs> it takes a lot of time away from work. Um, but to be serious, well, that was also kind of serious. But I feel like as an artist coming from a very problem region, I've always kind of prioritized the art making uh, above politics. Otherwise, I would have ended up as a political artist. And um, because I'm working a lot with female bodies and I'm a Muslim woman, there's, even if the work is personal, it automatically is so political that um, what I'm trying to do is just continue uh, down my own trajectory because I think as artists, what happens is that um, is that whatever you whatever you're making right now is going to kind of reflect right now, whether it's um, you know Trump or it's like um, a garden, it's going to reflect this time. So I'm sure there are certain things which have come into it, but in a way it also feels like it's too soon to say. Mm -hmm. It's just been a few months, and my um, my working process is kind of very. Slow. But one thing that has happened is that probably every single interview that I've done is no one is asking me about art anymore. They're all like, mm -hmm. so <laughs> let's talk about politics. <laughs> so I've had to like be much more um, attuned to uh, just even the political aspects of my work as opposed to the personal and. I've definitely started reading a lot more about American history and women's history and things like that. So I think all of that is kind of filtering in at a very subconscious level, mm -hmm. but nothing direct. Okay. One. Well, I think I'm still kind of like in the process of like internalizing and understanding things, but. Um, Definitely, maybe I could say that I've sh not necessarily like shift the thoughts and the ideas that I've been, you know, incorporating in my work and in my process. Because definitely, like, 
yes, I work with some sort of like a political angle, and that will that has always been like that. Um, but now, you know, I kind of like had a reflective moment by the end of the year, and I'm uh, shifting and kind of like uh, uh, putting more time towards teaching because I feel that I want to empower others, and if I have the tools to be able to make it and to be able to, you know, offer that, I'll definitely do it. So. Um, it's not that I'm compromising my practice, but I will say like 70 or 80 percent of my time right now is actually like focusing in teaching specifically and you know working with uh, immigrant students in different uh, high schools and different programs around the city. So that's so you're teaching high school students primarily? As, yes, okay. specifically teenagers, yes. And a lot of them are immigrant students? All of them, yes. All of them. So I, that's, um, I, that's something that I kind of like decided that I wanted to do because yeah, it's kind of like a very specific age gap, uh, you know, age gap, and uh, there's a lot of like help for uh, children. There's help for adults, but like there's always that kind of like process of you know from children to adult that always get uh, forgotten in a way, and especially with students, and especially with immigrants, like more because there's a lot to learn, a lot to assimilate. So I want to kind of like focus on that and empower them in that way. So if that if that is my mode of like I believe like protesting to it because I feel like I can reach more people you know uh, in that way. Wish mm -hmm. I could see some of that. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, with me, uh, I wouldn't say. I mean, it is it is too early to say how it's it's going to affect my work. But something interesting happened just like a week ago. Uh, so with my art practice, what I do is I interview people and get their stories and then I kind of uh, make objects out of it. So I spoke to this uh, woman from Bangladesh who I wanted to interview for my project just like a week ago. And uh, she was talking to me, she had tears in her eyes and she was like, you know, talking about the fears that she had as a Muslim woman here. And like, you know, the third thing that she told me was, just please make sure whatever goes into her art doesn't affect me, my green card process here. <laughs> so. It's this fear that people, I think, are having right now, and it's making me more aware as an artist as to how I bring out these stories in my work. So I think in that way, my art practice is definitely, it's, it's going to change now, I think. So. There is a lot, uh, the people that we work with here, mm -hmm. you know, some people we've asked to speak in front of groups or to media, and a lot of people say no because they're very afraid of risking anything. Yes. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fear right now. Yes. All right. Um, so if you feel like you, uh, well, do you notice any changes in the immigrant community that you associate with here um, since these changes have happened? Or if not a community, then in your life specifically outside of art? Um, I feel like everyone is so affected in the art world. Um, the day after election, no one came to work in Brooklyn. <laughs> it was just empty. Um, I think it was at least 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock before I saw the first phase. Um, the curators I'm working with right now had come over that night and one of them walked in crying. And everyone I met within that period of time was basically pretty devastated. I feel like it has it has created a lot of awareness um, of immigrants. I think when people are living here or born here, or even me after living here for five years, we kind of uh, lose lose sight of what we went through five years ago, or, or what someone else is going through right now, how their lives are being affected. Um, and we also don't, like I never saw um, little things going on around me which were very particular to people who've lived here all their <laughs> life, which I've started noticing a lot more. Um, so I think, uh, I've gone off on such a tangent, I can't even remember the question. <laughs> um, I think all the questions so far have kind of led us to this, to this question anyway, but just changes to um, the immigrant community here yeah. as you perceive them, or into your, in your life. I think in, in my life, in the art world, everyone has just been really proactive 
about trying to take care of each other, which is kind of nice. And then there's there are people on the periphery who are kind of more enabled by it and who are acting out in kind of terrible ways. And I, I know an artist, uh, she's uh, Jashri, mm -hmm. she's from India, and she walked out of her house yesterday and someone cornered her and got really in her face. And she also has this very like traditional Indian woman um, look about her, so that's creating. That was in New York? Yeah, that is, she lives in, in Brooklyn. Mm. So, and I think also what has happened is there's kind of this, everyone's stress level has skyrocketed, like overnight. We all wake up, we're reading the news, we're crazy. I, I'm, I'm not standing near the subway platform anymore. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, just like random, really random things are happening. But there is this uh, really interesting thing about how everyone is also coming together to um, protect everyone else, which is, I think, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think especially in New York, yeah. we feel that a little bit more. Is there any question from you? Well, let me see how it starts. So I think like, definitely like after the elections was kind of like very like evident. Um, that day I had to go to teach, at the, you know, that morning and I felt like I couldn't even put my thoughts together. So it was kind of like distracting, I feel. That was, m you know, my experience and I was very, you know, involved and I didn't want to, uh, you know, put my position or my thoughts to the group of students because I believe like everyone will have like diverse uh, comments. But it was very shocking for me to find out that most of my students or all of them knew exactly what was happening. They were extremely like eloquent. They were very um, aware, and that really not only like made me proud, but it was like you know it kind of like made me realize that you know they you know the, perhaps the work that you know we're all doing is like is is worth it, right? Because it make them um, yeah like analyze these things and um, and they're aware of what's happening. But definitely fear I, I've been seeing a lot. Um, students have been leaving, but like you know, leaving the school with no notice or anything, just, yeah, all of a sudden, like, you see, like, absences that are, like, running for, like, months. So, um, yeah, they claim that they have moved, like, who knows exactly what's happening, and sometimes that behavior, you know, you see that happening with one student, let's say, or rarely, and now I've been seeing it more since uh, coming back, uh, yeah, from uh, the winter break. So, um, yeah, I definitely fear, fear. Um, and I mean, most of the principals, at least like one of the schools that I'm like working uh, fully, I she has allocated some help and some um, uh, yeah, like uh, social work for some students and private offices to kind of like talk to them because uh, definitely they don't know what direction where this is going to go. And yeah, the majority of them are like undocumented and that raise uh, some other things in terms of like uh, for you know community like art events which I've been uh, involved working with uh, Lincoln Center for the past like year um, one of the meetings that that I have heard you know during the meetings and commentary that I have heard uh, from people that lead different community organizations art organizations and kind of family and education oriented is that um, I think definitely fear has changed the numbers of like how people participate in community activities and in art activities, uh, especially for children and for families. Um, and they, you know, they're kind of like, there's some organizations that are even thinking and strategizing different alternative to reach the community without perhaps like going inside of a building because there's even the fear that, you know, if there's an event that happens in a building that belongs to the government, like that might be an opportunity for them to kind of like take over, or for them to like be profiled. So that's, you know, and that's necessarily not the nature of like, what it is and what uh, these organizations intend to do because they want to be welcoming. But again, it's just the misinformation and the insecurity that, that is happening around. Yeah. Um, with me, with the art world, right now it's, it's very difficult for me to answer on that level because I'm a new mother. So I've been a little lost with that part of my world uh, for the last six months. 
but uh, I've been, uh, so I work, I also work as an art educator. I work for people with uh, learning and developmental disabilities. And for me, going to work the day after Trump was elected was actually, I, if, if there was a dull sense and like, like nobody was talking to one another at work. Everybody was like very silent, just going about their work. But in a way, it was, it was kind of breaking away from all that because also like, you know, the people that we work with, they had like, you know, they were just talking about their day and it was, it was a very different feeling working there. But on a personal level, uh, what I went through, like, you know, in the recent past, like my husband was, when he went to the DMV to get his uh, license renewed, he was questioned if he was a Muslim. So it's, it's just like, you know, ignorance that I, and hate and fear mongering that's been going around that is really affecting people these days. And uh, my kid was crying in the night and somebody, like one of the neighbors, and we've been neighbors for six years, I think now, and the neighbor uh, knocked on our door one evening and said, there's a baby crying in here. And it was a, I'm sorry for this language, but it was a white person knocking on the door and saying that there's a baby crying in here and I can't sleep. So like, you know, these things, and I just feel like people are empowered to do and say whatever they want to do now. And it is, it, it is kind of difficult at this point to kind of just to get on with everyday life. Like when my husband leaves for work, I'm scared now. Like, you know, that if he's questioned, if something happens to him. And just coming from the Indian community with what happened in Kansas City, my husband worked at Garmin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, you know, he worked at Garmin five years ago. And um, he actually kind of related that to that incident a lot because he said he used to frequent that bar a lot. Like he used to go with his friends. So like, you know, the people have been, it's, it's even the documented immigrants, like even the, uh, the highly skilled immigrants that are also kind of affected by what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's very, it's kind of a fear that people are living with every day, I think. And that's how it's affected me too. Oh. Um, let's rewind the clock a couple of months and not think about Trump in answering the next question or any of his minions. Um, talk about the artist's community in your home country and the artist community here in New York and tell us how they're similar and how they're different. Um, well, Pakistan has a very small community, artist community, compared to a city like New York, which is just everyone I meet is an artist. Um, and most of the practicing artists literally come from one school. And um, they all know each other, so it's very cliquey. Um, and also, they're all making political art. And that, that started um, around 9-11, after the Clown War. Uh, that, that became, or they're working on um, colonialism. There's still a lot of post-colonial trauma over there. So that's mostly what people are doing. Um, there are a few galleries, you know, it's small, but it's thriving. And uh, a lot of, some of our very famous artists are well known. Like one of my teacher had an installation up on the metro. Um, so they're not like, they're not invisible. But in New York, they're kind of invisible because there's really no South Asian art community, I guess. Like there's, there's no market. I guess in New York, it's very market oriented. So there's no market for South Asian art unless you're working with one South Asian art gallery which has expat collectors. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, it's also a little conservative in the way that um, if you kind of want to work in Pakistan, you sort of need to paint what everyone is painting because it's a very tiny market. And definitely painting nudes is not the way to go as a woman. <laughs> Um, New York is, I feel, much larger. Uh, it's also definitely about the cool kids and the not so cool kids. I'm a not so cool kid. Um, and, but because it's so big, there's a little bit of something for everyone. So most people are finding work here, and that's um, 
it's weird, but when I went to grad school here, they basically tell you that you're going to starve to death and never find a job, and artists are losers. Literally, in grad school, this is what they were telling us every single day, that there's no work for artists over here. And kind of when you leave school, you're just like, oh, I'm a loser. <laughs> but because the art world is, is so big, um, and there are opportunities for everyone. Uh, so it kind of, I think that's really exciting, the multiculturalism, the diversity. Um, you can make so many connections with people. Um, that's great. When I was being critical, this is slightly off topic, of uh, America for Trump, I know we're pretending <laughs> he's not around. Um, I actually started thinking about Pakistan and the fact that even in the community where I come from, it's an Islamic republic, so everyone kind of has to be the same. Um, and then I was like, how can I criticize everyone here when everyone over there is exactly the same? But I think the great thing about New York is that everyone is not really the same. Uh, there is a lot of diversity, definitely, there are times when you feel very marginalized as an immigrant artist um, because you don't tick certain boxes. And uh, that creates a certain exclusion. And I'm hoping that will change by the time my kids have kids. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what I, that's what I like. OK. Do you remember the question? <laughs> that was a great answer, really good answer. Uh, that way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely I remember because I kind of like, I've been thinking about it actually, even before having this conversation, I've been having, you know, to kind of like face that question myself. Um, the differences between especially like Puerto Rico and like New York are extremely big and, you know, extremely. I think, I think Puerto Rico, in terms of like an art scene, if you want to call it, there's uh, a lot of like talent in a very small place in an island that you can just like in less than a couple of hours like see water on both sides, and you know, so that creates a lot of tension because you have like colleagues that are like you know, you know, doing amazing work, but that sense of like community or like partnership or like working together is still in some sort of like development. So it's like. Uh, there's this idea that it's 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 kind of like very individualistic and kind of like a, you know like market driven because there's that desire to achieve that uh, you know reputation and to make a profit out of what you do so you ended up like you know I don't want to be like very radical but you know you ended up being in an environment where everyone is like chopping everyone's head for opportunities and everyone is like so good that it just creates tension. Um, and I think what sets like differences is just um, education and opportunities because uh, Puerto Rico maybe have like one or two institutions that have like higher degrees to say like MFAs like full that can offer that but they're not in the level of like things that you can find in here and if we want to talk about that academic you know uh, uh, aspect definitely like New York filled all of that and and because it's a larger city the metropolitan city and so on and so forth but and there it just becomes like very uh, a lot of tension now I see um, differences in there people are very risky and people do things for for the love of like art and the love of like hanging out so you can be in an opening exhibition for like you know I don't know six seven hours just like hanging out and like you know, seeing interesting art with your colleagues and it feels like less stressful. I feel that in New York everything, because there's a market, there's a time, there's a limit, you know, things need to be done between this and that. There is, it has been extremely, extremely highly professionalized, which, you know, at some point is, is interesting, but, um, you know, in comparison to Puerto Rico, it's just way more flexible. Um, there might be just like a handful of galleries that might be like doing some international like outreach and there is, I will say like maybe three of them that might be very, very serious. In New York there's a, you know, a, like large amount, of, like, you know, over past the, you know, the, the, the list. So, you know, so, so there's that, you know, like it's like the one or two percent in comparison to New York that, you know, that hundred percent. But, um, 
definitely more risky people are there and 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 I see a lot of like willingness to like put time and put things together like you know like I don't know getting a building and just like painting the walls on white yeah we're gonna have like an exhibition in the next like couple of like days or something and just people like jump on that and they do it because they they love it and because they want to do it in terms of um, practices is extremely diverse so, so from like painting to like performance to like installations to you know everything and thematics just run uh, all over I think like mostly like political because of course like you know there's a lot of like political condition happening there so like people I think are very argumentative about that and I think that also like feeds like you know the kind of like work that I do because I've been in those environments New York is, is, is very diverse and very multicultural and and diverse practices, diverse points of view, which I definitely appreciate. Yeah. I'm yeah. just having a flashback to a trip um, that we took to San Juan. We were trying to find galleries, <laughs> and we wandered around in the like sweatiest heat and didn't, couldn't find any yeah. galleries. It was really hard. Because it's, um, it's kind of like a small community, and like you know, once you know like someone that can give you access, it's just like oh, it's in the street. You have to talk to this person, and from yeah. there to there, it just kind of like you know, you create those connections, but if you want to know like that, like in New York, you can just find, you know, Chelsea, or can find some of the institutions and museums and everything, you have that access, and there's just a little bit more tricky, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, India is more conservative when it comes to the kind of art, like you just like Pakistan, like the one that Hiba was talking about, this, this, like, you know, as a woman artist, it's very difficult to find people doing nudes. Like, you know, that doesn't happen. Uh, the political conditions there also kind of prevent people from doing art the, they want to do. Uh, when it comes to galleries, there are, a very, there are very few galleries, and all in the metro cities, so in Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, these are the only cities that you really find, like, uh, good galleries. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot, lot of talented people there. Uh, very, very few people find representation. So, and like, you know, it's very difficult to make your living as an artist in India. And I think it's, it's definitely not easier, but it's much better as an artist here. Like, you know, and I think for me personally, I found a community in New York compared to India. Uh, that also might have been because I was just a student and I didn't really work. Uh, and I think the one thing that India, I think, should, I mean, this is the direction that I kind of envision for India in the future is for India to have alternative art spaces, which like, you know, New York has a lot of, like, you see a lot of street art, you see a lot of these spaces that are abandoned being converted into art spaces that you don't really see a lot of in India. Uh, and I think the one, the other thing that I think is not happening in India is also like, you know, more, like, artists being more honest. And that is, again, due to the political conditions that exist there, too. Uh, in New York, I think, like, you know, uh, it's, I, I found my own art community here. It's much more open. You, uh, like, you know, you do find work, like Eva was saying. Like, you, you, can, you can make a living in some form or the other. So, um, yeah, I think these are basically the two differences that I, and there's a lack of community art in India. Like, you know, I think it's, uh, there, there are some people that are doing that. But you don't find it on a large scale like you see it here. Uh, and even that, I think, is kind of filtered. Even the community art that is happening there is, again, filtered because of the political conditions there, too. So you just uh, mentioned finding your community here. Mm -hmm. How did you find your community? Uh, I think City College was one of the, like, you know, Audra, Lionel, all, they've been colleagues in City College. Oh. Uh, I've found a very good, uh, like, you know. <laughs> so this is your community right here. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, like, you know, like, you find people, uh, like, you know, Hiba was saying, there's a very small group of Southeast Asian artists here. So I interned for somebody and then I found four or five people from there. Like, you know, the opportunities that New York gives you, I think that's the way I found my community. I started working, uh, like you know, in the uh, in the education sector, and I met few more people from there. So I think that's the way I found my community in New York. Do we have time for two more questions? We definitely do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to someone who just just came from your home country um, and is trying to find their way in the art world in New York? Hopefully. Don't tell them that they're all losers. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think the, generally the advice that I usually give to starting artists, wherever they're from, is you know if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be an artist, you make art. Um, I really believe that to a large degree in life we reap what we sow. So I think working on what you want to do is really important. That said, <laughs> a gallerist once told me um, at a studio visit, I always tell my artists not to quit their jobs because it's too much pressure. It's too much pressure on the artist. It's too much pressure on the gallery, uh, which seems like good advice. Uh, I probably wouldn't give it, but I know it makes sense uh, to a certain level. And I think that um, the, the last thing is to get to know people, attend openings, because when you get here, you're literally invisible and everyone knows everyone people who've grown up here or lived here for a long time everyone knows everyone they've also slept with everyone and <laughs> it's just really interesting I, I love it you know they sit and they tell you about it like all together as a group <laughs> keeps them together as well, like they're very loyal to each other. <laughs> I don't think that's just because <laughs> So you would tell someone to sleep with a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would definitely say that if no one knows you exist, then no one can show your work. So go to all the openings, go to your friends' openings, go to the dinners, hang out with other artists, because we all are trying to do the same thing, and we all have to support each other. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. <laughs> I definitely agree with, you know, with some of the things that you said, definitely. Like, I think there's the art world and, you know, whatever is called, or all of the many art worlds that are around, it's, it's a very social uh, environment, so I think, I think you know, one have to be aware of that, that, you know, you are just in a social, you know, place that that's what it leads into some other professional, like, opportunities, partnerships, so on and so forth. Um, if I would give an advice, I think, I don't even know where to start because New York has a long, long, long history since maybe, like, 1950s, back in 1950s or even earlier, of a lot of, like, Puerican, uh, you know, uh, uh, important people that like move here since like the first like wave of migration and now we're in the second one who have done like extremely, extremely radical things, founded institutions, you know, um, activism, you know, like claiming communities, you know, offering opportunities for others. So uh, one thing is like, you know, for me it was kind of like being aware of all of that background and knowing that, you know, I'm just, I'm just continuing and following some sort of like legacy of, of, of a community that already exists here. But nevertheless, like you just walk in, in, in a place and you just feel alone. You're like, oh my God, where is all of these people? So one of the things that helped me was affiliating and associating with other colleagues, but also with uh, institutions. So I like one, the first place that I like step in was in an organization in the South Bronx called Casita Maria, Center for Arts and Education. They have a long, long, long history working in the South Bronx, you know, for almost like 80 years. And, um, uh, you know, of course, the organization is like run by a lot of like, you know, Puerto Rican descents and everything. And like, that was kind of like a way of access. And it wasn't like that easy. I have to definitely like prove them that I can definitely do it and, and take upon and like, you know, prove them that I know how to do these things. Um, you know, even having like reports, even having like recommendations from people back there, it's just like in here was like, it's a different thing, you know, and, and I was, I still, for most of, the, of them, like, the boy from the island, you know, that just came here, even though we're all, like, Puerto Ricans and we're supposed to be, like, one community, right? So, um, I think it's just being aware of that and having, building out that respect and being, uh, you know, kind of, like, uh, uh, respectful of each other and knowing, like, our, our talents and, you know, the things that we can offer. Um, and just if it's another Puerto Rican, but just call me, you know, like t send me a text message. I'm available on Facebook or there. And anyone, like it's just, you know, you can just text me and that's it. And that, I think like uh, 
the mediums of communication and, and technologies have allowed to that, so like the, that gap could be like, you know, it's, it's, it's cut. <laughs> um, I think, uh, like, you know, the general art practice in India is to just paint by yourself, and you expect that people will will come to you. Like, you know, there's, there's this, uh, this this thing where there's a stigma of like going out and talking about your work. There's a belief that like you know your work should speak for itself, and it's changing though. It's changing slowly. So I think one of the uh, things that I would tell any of my colleagues who would like to come here is like you know just work hard but work smart. Like you know like Hiba was just mentioning like you know go out to openings, talk to people, uh, just get out there and like you know just just get out of your shell. Work hard but also get out of your shell and just. And share. <laughs> yes. Share your work. Yes. I've got to say, I met my gallerist on Instagram, though. Oh. I've never been to his gallery, so I'm not great with openings. But <laughs> I know that it's a sure shot, because when I do go, then everyone is much more satisfied that you are there and you're a part of, part of the group. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Actually, just on that note, like you know, this is a note to myself too, because I shy away from going to social gatherings. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep reminding myself, like, okay, I should keep in touch with people. Like, you know, I should go out there and talk to people. So for me, in opposite, I had to like make a calendar and like stick to it and say, like, okay, I need to make a selection of events that I should go and should not, because otherwise I'll be like out every single day and not, do, you know. So like, I have to keep it a balance. So yeah. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> mm. It's good, it's good. All right, um, so bringing it back to present situations, um, what potential do you see for human rights to be positively impacted by the arts community partnering more closely with social justice organizations? That's such a complicated question. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> um, so, a lot of my experience with social justice organizations have been has been at home, um, and you know, I worked in art programs where, but you know, it's it's also such a different community. There's like ninety nine percent of the population is not literate. Kids don't have education. They start working really young. So a lot of it was about. Like just doing summer programs, going into communities, and things like that. And I think, I think in the U.S. there's a lot more scope for that connection because there's a lot more awareness for art um, as compared to other parts of the world, especially in New York. People respect art, and um, I think that. Like starting at some level, starting awareness at a very at a very young age um, is good. So I remember reading about this program that one of the museums was doing. I think it was the Hammer Museum, and they had called in. They were doing these groups of children who were coming in, and they were using objects on view at exhibitions to uh, teach the kids about racism and things like that and children were making their own work based on those themes and I think that can actually bring about change. I mean there's always this argument, can art really change anything? But I think when you use it so constructively that you're teaching young children about like, problems in society as opposed to they're just growing up without really, um, really understanding the, the the real global picture. I think it things like that work really well. That's all I thought. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if, if if you know definitely like partnership between like artists and organizations that believe in like uh, human rights and you know and. and fight about it and uh, definitely social justice um, should happen, but I feel like it should be something where it's, um, where it's like uh, kind of like organized and strategized and perfectly programmed because like, I feel that 
Um, most institutions like have the intentions to do that and have the intentions of bringing the art, bringing the artists, yes, because they could bring people and like they believe in some sort of like this idealistic sense that like things could happen, but there's no, let's say, no goals to achieve, there's no order to achieve that, and that tend to kind of like break relationships between like artists and like, you know, the purpose and the, and the final, you know, like, uh, purpose of like the projects or the initiative that really happen and um, I've seen that in here with some you know with some artists and some you know organizations so I think like and I I, I mean I hope that most of those you know, you know the, 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 there's a way or an instructor that those relationships can like happen more fluid um, and I think it's just that like knowing what is the expectations on both ends because um, you know uh, artists have like certain ways of like working and certain ways of doing things as well like organizations so at the point that both of them are synchronized and it, you know it's beneficial for both of them but yeah I think it's just more strategy, uh, strategy and I'm not being pessimistic I think like I, I see it and, and it's an opportunity for all of us to like learn and I think it should be yeah should be like implemented a method, right? Like as we have for education, as we have for health, as we have for other things like yes partnerships and like learning yeah, what well, sense is important. Uh, I think there's there's definitely like a potential for artists to uh, like you know to work with social justice organizations. But like Lionel was saying, like you have to be very aware as an artist too. Like as an artist, like how much of that do you really want to bring into the work that you're doing? Uh, but I've seen like positive partnerships happening too. Like you know, the Lonman Project is one of the social justice mm -hmm. organization that works very strongly with art. Like you know, that is my personal experience. And the thing is, with that, also what happens is the organization gave a lot of. I worked as a fellow there, and the organization gave us a lot of. Um, not like you know, they gave us a lot of things that we had to remember as artists going out into the community. Like we have this specific relationship with the community. We want you to be careful as artists when you're going out there. So like, you know, the thing is not careful, but like they, they did say that we have to be very aware of what we are bringing as artists into the community. So I think uh, as, because what happened, and like, you know, it can work in a positive way because sometimes like as artists, like you might be the foreign person in there. Like, you know, you might be a new person going out into the community wanting to do something and the, the organization might actually help you find a way into that place. So I think it has to, like, there has to be, um, uh, awareness on both ends to make that partnership happen in a very positive way. Okay. Yeah. So I have one last question. I think it's an easier one. And then we'll turn it to the audience for Q&A. They might be tough on you, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, there have been so many opportunities for arts and or activist groups to kind of come to the forefront in the last few months. And I think that's one of the best things that's come out of you know, the post-election time. Are there any organizations that you would want to call attention to today um, to let people know about them if they may not already know? Either new to you or one that you've been working with for a while or aware of. Like which are working with communities or which are yeah, just arts or activist groups or anything that, that's kind of stuck out to you. Um, as a, uh, you know, Something that you think demand or de uh, deserves attention. But in the art world specifically, um, a bunch of art galleries and artists formed a random group called Tierra Ivanka. They weren't doing anything for mm -hmm. the community, but you know, made a lot of people's lives miserable. And <laughs> I hope that counted for something. But it's mostly, uh, yeah. I guess focusing on um, the first daughter, daughter's anti-feminism, and I think in many ways it's like they're they're trying to be present at a lot of um, at all the all the rallies, whether it's um, you know the women's march or a rally for uh, uh, transgender people or immigrants. Um, Well, I think uh, some of the organizations that I've been like doing partnerships even before elections, like they are and they have some sort of like in like a very strong like interest and and, and programming build up into um, you know 
reaching out and creating that awareness. So, um, and I think that's that's the purpose of why I am affiliated with them in the first place. And that's why they, you know, have like have long discussions with me, and we have created mutual projects together. So that is something that you know, like I kind of like take in consideration, you know, doing a partnership because it's, it's both reputations, right? So. Um, you know, and there's most of them are like here in New York City, so yeah. Um, Can you toss out a couple of things? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, again, what was I mean, powerful like into like Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center in Institute that was before, and now it's Lincoln Center Education. They definitely their their entire programming and their time outreach and why like they bring like artists, you know, to do all of these partnerships and programs in different communities. It's, with an intention that it's, you know, like the, the, the work that you do have to be very intertwined with the community and have to create that like social awareness and like um, and the social justice and so on and so forth. So definitely, um, yeah, and same thing in, in, you know, several organizations in the Bronx that I've been working. So, yeah, so I think it's, it's good. <laughs> uh, I think two organizations that really uh, come up to my mind because I've been working with them uh, for quite some time now. One is the Laundromat Project. Uh, if uh, most of you probably know about it, uh, but if you don't, it's an organization that uh, mainly works with community-based projects. So artists who want to work within the community and they want to bring uh, people together. It's a very neighborly, uh, community-based organization. Uh, the other organization that I can think of is HRC. Uh, that's a, a place that I work at. Uh, it's an organization that serves people with the developmental and intellectual disabilities. So, uh, and that organization needs a lot more activist artists coming and working there. So, they're trying to change the face of art in that organization, which is mostly therapy as of now. So. Well, thank you all for um, really, really rich answers to these questions and a good conversation. Uh, definitely want to turn it to the audience for a few questions. Uh, how much time do you think we have for that? Um, I would say maybe like five to ten minutes. Okay. We still have time for some more refreshments after. <laughs> Great. I'd love to rewind a lot um, <laughs> and hear just about your path as an artist, like how you got to, to be an artist, maybe from like the very, very beginning, um, and why you chose to be done or pursue it. I think those are the choice and pursue it. Do you guys want to start? Because you're both looking at me. <laughs> 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 I started painting really young and um, I always knew I was going to be an artist. Uh, I guess I was either really lucky or really unlucky. And I went to art school twice. <laughs> uh, once was in Pakistan and once was here in New York, in Brooklyn. Um, do, are you looking for something in particular? Some, like, are you looking for some particular insight? Um, or just if you encounter challenges or pushback from oh. others? And oh, that's kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> 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 the meat of that. <laughs> um, my parents are really conservative. Like, my father's beard is this long. So, subject matter was an issue. I think I didn't go public with my artwork until a few years ago, and that's also mostly because I had a fracture and I was in bed rest for a long time, and so I, I went online to communicate with people. But there is always going to be a lot of pushback as an artist. I mean, everyone is going to want you to change. You're never going to be good enough. Your work is never going to be good enough. It's not going to be expensive enough. Everyone else is going to be doing better. And I think really the only way you can be an artist is to just believe that it's possible. Like it's, if you're an artist, then you're an artist, no matter what. No matter who says what, does what. And you just kind of have to follow, follow that. I'm going back. <laughs> um, maybe I know that I start like very very young. I can be able to remember, but I know that my parents tell me that I start like doing kind of like doodles and sketching and like you know drawing in the walls. So that was kind of like uh, you know like and making this like long drawings all along the wall. So I guess that is that was kind of like the initial 
like jumping into that. And I feel that they were very, oh, my parents were, were very open and very like supportive of that because they had other family members who were like, I don't, I think, you know, you should definitely focus into this and not give it for granted. So um, I have support of both my parents and I'm lucky about that because I think if I would be in another family, I would be killed a long time ago. <laughs> so um, from that part, yes, it's great. And also um, I think I had the opportunity of like being, you know, like trained into that very like early. So, you know, I took my first art class when I was like, you know, maybe like six, seven years old, and it was like kind of like in a university and a program through the University of Puerto Rico. And then that kind of like lead into, I was in a high school that was especially for fine arts, so I had this like multidisciplinary environment since very early, extremely open-minded. So that definitely, definitely changed. Like I was like taking a ballet class and then like moving into doing photography in a, in a, in a dark room. So like that, those multiple experiences like feed into like the type of like you know, work that I do and the interests that I have and the opportunities that I hope to offer to like the people that I that I reach. Um, and I think, yeah, that's how pretty much how I started. And 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 kind of like think, thinking optimistically about what I'm doing and being serious. I think like and, and definitely like even if people tell you, yeah, definitely that's not worth it. I think like having that self confidence and being like, yeah, I know I know what I want to say and I know how to say it and I know how to communicate it. So. That confidence is important. Um, my earliest memory of painting was, I think, painting greeting cards every year for New Year's and sending it to all my relatives. <laughs> um, I think I, I, I had very supportive parents too. Like, you know, they were like, okay, do whatever you have to do. Like, you know, uh, my dad was like, you don't have to become a doctor or an engineer, which is the norm in India. He's like, whatever you do, you have to follow 100%. That's the only condition I have. So uh, I had very supportive parents, but I had a whole lot of other people, relatives and teachers telling me that I shouldn't be taking up arts because I still remember my high school teacher told me, I don't think you're, you're a brilliant student, you shouldn't be doing art, you're going to be walking around with a canvas tote bag with no money in your pocket if you do that. So uh, I definitely face a lot of like you know uh, uh, opposition with other people. Uh, but I think like again like you know having the opportunity to be trained in art uh, like you know right out of high school uh, that's where I did my painting classes. I was a painter before I moved to New York uh, and I'm still a painter but I'm also an installation artist right now. Uh, but uh, I think just following up on whatever you, there are, there's, there's, there's going to be days where you're just like there's somebody better than you like you know, you're going to always feel that you're not earning enough money there's somebody always better than you there might be a colleague who's on the same level doing a lot more things than you but just following up on your path and just being like okay this is going to be my path and this is the way i'm going to do it so just believing in that i think is the most important thing okay, one more question Does kind of feel like a nice point to end on. Start at the very beginning. <laughs> thank you all so much. Uh, I hope you, you all enjoyed that as much as I did. So, as I understand it, I think there's some more uh, rum to be. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks again to Amberly Global for hosting. Um, it's really been a pleasure. And we have some more refreshments outside, which includes rum and some sea salt popcorn. I think there's mango juice. <laughs>